Right. Well, welcome to everyone. Uh, please remember to put the translation on, English to Spanish, as may be appropriate. Can I say it's an enormous pleasure for me to invite you all on behalf of the UK branch of PBI and the Alliance for Lawyers at Risk to participate in the third annual awards ceremony of the Sir Henry Book Award for Human Rights Defenders. Uh, these are strange times uh, and uh, we cannot, alas, enjoy the advantage of meeting these impressive award winners face to face. Uh, nor meeting our friends and colleagues over a drink or even three or four. Uh, we're all located in our own private spaces, but coming together online to recognize the work done by our two principal prize winners. Uh, Dina Metzer is from Honduras, a journalist who has a history of standing up for the, uh, against the authorities to protect human rights, not least from fellow colleagues in the journalist field who are at risk for practicing freedom of expression. Rinaldo Villalba is a lawyer from Colombia and very active in a non-government organization, a human rights organization. Uh, you'll hear more from them later and they will also speak about their activities. Uh, incidentally, one of my favorite bottles of wine is actually an Argentinian Malbec called Villalba. So if Rinaldo has any links, do let me know, it'd be very useful. Uh, not everyone joining us today shares the cold and bleak weather of the UK, and I have to say it's particularly dank and misty in Cambridge, where I'm based. Uh, we're particularly delighted that there are a number of you joining from uh, the warmer climes of Central and South America, and we welcome you most warmly. We also welcome and thank the translators, of course, who are uh, enabling us to follow what's going on. Uh, both PBI and the Alliance for Lawyers mm. at Risk seek to provide practical and moral support for those who fight in support of human rights. They act on behalf of some of the most disadvantaged and marginalized groups in the com community. Frequently, this involves providing active support for indigenous communities, particularly in relation to environmental and equality issues. Many of these HRDs face daily threats and harassment not only to themselves, but often to the members of their families. All too often the threats are carried out. It's shocking, in fact, how many HRDs are murdered for taking a stand in favor of human rights. It takes enormous courage to stand up for human rights against the power of the state or against powerful organizations which the state is either unwilling or unable to control. All HRDs operating in these areas deserve awards, and I think we should see the award winners today not just as deserving individuals in their own right, which they undoubtedly are, but as representatives of the community of HRDs, who are for the most part unseen and unsung. Well, in our small way, we're trying to put that right today. Uh, we sing their praises. The awards will be presented by Colin Passmore and Dominic Grieve QC, both very distinguished lawyers. Colin is a senior partner of a major law firm, Simmons & Simmons, which has itself made a significant contribution to assisting HRDs as part of its pro bono activities. He's apparently written one of the leading texts on legal professional privilege, uh, but you mustn't hold that against him. Uh, Dominic is a barrister, a distinguished QC, formerly an MP and Attorney General, in fact, for four years from 2010. He'll be very well known to the UK participants for what was generally recognised, I think, across all parties as a most courageous and principled stand against the leaders of his own Conservative Party uh, in relation to various Brexit issues. But don't worry, Dominic, we're not going to go into all that tonight. Um, we're grateful to them both for agreeing to take part in this ceremony. The awards are, of course, given in the name of Sir Henry Brooke. Sir Henry was responsible, together with Susie Baskin, the redoubtable head of PBI UK, for initially setting up the alliance some 10 years ago. Sadly, he died in 2018, not long before the first awards were given in his name. He was an outstanding judge who was involved in a variety of organizations whose aim was to advance principles of equality and human rights. More importantly, he was also a generous and humane man with enormous compassion and complete integrity. 
I have no doubt that he would have been delighted and I suspect humbled to see such outstanding individuals as Dina and Ronaldo being honored in his name. I can assure them that they too should feel honored that they have an, an award which bears his name. Uh, I now pass over to Dominic Grieve, who is going to introduce a film about the rule of law. Over to you, Dominic, thank you. It's a great pleasure uh, to be able to participate this evening as uh, the invitation of Peace Brigades International and all the work that they have done uh, in order to support human rights defenders. It made me think a little bit about my own role as Attorney General. When I was appointed Attorney General in uh, 2010, I had to go to court and in court, I had to take an oath in front of all the judges. In doing so, the oath dated back to the 16th century, the time of Queen Elizabeth I. And I noted with amusement, but also with pleasure, that in that oath, it required me to say that I would use my skills on the government's behalf as its principal lawyer, with a responsibility for prosecution and for representing the government in the courts, but that I would not abuse my post in order to delay or deny justice to anybody else. That, of course, is the very essence of the rule of law. It's what has given us in this country a particularly privileged position. But the fact that we enjoy that privilege shouldn't make us complacent. On the contrary, it's something to be guarded because it's precious and of great importance. And we don't have to look too far outside our own borders to see places where this simply doesn't happen. Of course, it can all be by degree. There will be instances uh, where uh, the uh, rule of law is simply being a little bit eroded round the edges. People have difficulty in obtaining justice. But in other circumstances, it goes very much further. It actually creates a climate in which getting justice is well nigh impossible. And we meet this evening precisely because we want to celebrate those who in such conditions of difficulty are putting their, often their own lives at risk in order to try to make sure that justice is done and is obtainable by all within their countries. That's the purpose of the Peace Brigades and that's what's brought us together this evening. Now, there is a film available which we can look at now and which I think sets out with great eloquence what the work of human rights defenders is all about. And I would really like it to be compulsory viewing for all the politicians, in particularly even in my own country, because I think that when they see it, they will appreciate all the more just how important are the benefits that we have the privilege to enjoy. Therefore, let us proceed to watch this video. It's all, always worth lawyers, I think, going back and revisiting what they understand by the rule of law. So the rule of law is all about fairness, due process, access to justice. A set of principles through which all aspects of life uh, can be conducted. Those rules keep us safe and give us justice, and I call that the rule of law. Because it gives us a mechanism by which we can enforce rights and have rights. Use of how law should be used to improve people's lives. So effective and humane justice system and institutions are fundamental to building societies that facilitate growth and development. The rule of law not being necessarily something that we um, consider on a day-to-day -day basis in the comfort of our jobs. We do not value the rule of law sufficiently in a society without the rule of law, citizens will experience a fragmented, fragmented and frequently ineffective legal 
and judicial system and a significant lack of capacity and accountability of government institutions. You immediately feel it. You immediately, again, start to have your safety rug start to be tugged from under you. That safety rug of the rule of law. Um, I mean, w without it, um, there ceases to be legal certainty and legal protection. And, and that's ultimately what hurts the vulnerable the most. Um, they're the people who, who feel it first. And that means that there will be an increase in attacks on members of the legal profession and human rights defenders because they will be more vulnerable uh, to uh, criminal activity. What we do see in many jurisdictions is stigmatization of lawyers who are representing those who uh, governments don't uh, agree with or are thorn in the side of governments. I'd say oppressive techniques used against a lot of people that PBI companies, and this has really become a big thing in recent years, has been the criminalization of human rights defenders. You can't help but respond to it. Um, particularly I just being vilified by the the authorities and the state as well I find really shocking I mean where that that is meant to be you know your your that, that's where your support should be from um, and Kahar itself was uh, receiving not only death threats um, but attempts to bug their offices also uh, def defamatory campaigns in the press um, people might be kidnapped for a certain number of hours, be threatened that if they didn't stop their work, then there would be worse repercussions to come. People would approach their friends, their loved one, and tell them to pass on a message. Sometimes that would be coded, sometimes it would be an outright threat, but certainly family members were not off limits, nor were children. It wasn't uncommon for people's children to be approached outside their school. Threats from sectors of military intelligence, uh, th threats from um, some units of the police, threats from under unknown individuals. Um, none of these were duly um, investigated. Uh, corruption has a devastating effect in the entire justice system because there is six to perpetuate impunity. In a situation um, like in Uraba, um, was that I enjoyed a degree of protection that local people didn't. Um, nonetheless, I uh, remember being followed in the street. I remember people coming up to me in pickup trucks, uh, slowing down as I walked down the street. Calling that people should be uh, subject to threats of doing, doing their job properly and for defending rights. And the state should make sure they aren't threatened. Um, and that was low-level intimidation by comparison. Um, but the chill I felt at being approached by people with very sinister motives um, was very powerful. And it gave me just a little glimpse of what Colombians deal with day after day. I think it's a huge luxury being a lawyer working in human rights in this country. I don't face threats going to court. But one's able to live a very normal life. Quite often when I visit other countries, um, you know, one has armed protection. You know, I'm always happy and proud to tell people what I do. That's a luxury that's simply not reality for people operating in fragile societies. And that, you know, that they would carry on doing that work despite, you know, terrible things happening. As a, as a fellow professional, you feel, well, how, how could I work in those circumstances? You hope you would be able to, but um, you, actually, you actually face the risks you, you can't say, can you? It's very easy to say things from the safety of where we are now. I'm just humbled by that kind of work because I would, um, I, I struggle to see whether I could do it in those in those kind of circumstances. You know, people's family members were were, were killed, and um, being there with those people um, while they sort of work through 
that grief but carried on with their work was was um was amazing and i you know i just left with a feeling of uh, admiration at the the struggle that the people were were engaged in it is just a different it's a different world so you know you do wonder what actually you can do to help in that world or indeed how you would react if you were in it um i found working in pro bono work uh, alongside organizations like peace brigade international um not only humbling but also very educational for me pbi uk indirectly works towards supporting the rule of law and it does that essentially by the work the pbi does with lawyers uh, and victims groups and various other human rights defenders in the field and i think the purpose of alliance is simply for a set of people who share values but recognize they are privileged to at least feel they are trying to do something uh, to support people for whom those very same things uh, are, are a danger and a risk. And I do consider that we have a responsibility within the UK to work to protect lawyers and human rights defenders in Colombia, Honduras, Kenya, so many countries around the world where they do need our support. And the international community was very much there to um, echo and reinforce what they were saying and ensure that the information of what was happening on the ground and what the local civilian uh, civic society groups were asking for, well, to amplify that and take that to the decision makers outside of Colombia um, into the to the UN or to the inter-American sphere. And I really considered that just the fact of them knowing that we are watching and that we're listening when there is an issue does, in my experience, it certainly does seem to help them. I met human rights lawyers for the first time in London, in fact, um, and uh, was astonished by their bravery and how they managed to continue to work in the face of these threats. They need to know how important they are to the world of global justice. They are making a huge difference within their own particular countries and their own states in helping the vulnerable, helping those without a voice. And that's why human rights defenders often play an essential role in allowing victims, and often in countries in which it's difficult to get access, is where you get the worst violations of human rights. So human rights defenders play an essential role in giving voice to victims. And I just remember that when the lawyer for the victim stood up to speak, she had the whole room gripped and she was really able to inject that humanity into the court process. And I just thought that it was such an important job and that really she was doing history. Glimpses of what should be done through their work uh, without them, uh, I think that task would, would be uh, unachievable. Because to stand up, um, knowing that you're not just standing up against those military officers who are outside, but the whole system behind them, it was really something quite remarkable. And I thought, wow, this is, this is, this is where change happens. I was particularly struck by the inventiveness, resilience, and the, their attachment to the rule of law to try and find ways of making international law work for them, how to apply it um, in the field, in the middle of the Darien jungle. But also they are contributing on the international stage to keep the international law strong by using it and using it to hold uh, governments and executives to account. Because if they were not there, the waters would close over the rule of law. The reasons that you are not doing it are not money or status, because um, the lawyers that we accompany don't have much of either, I suspect, within the countries where they work. Um, I think they are moved by 
their ability to be compassionate, to have empathy of the suffering and the marginalization of communities or, or even people. The, their search for truth and their search for justice is relentless. In, in a way, they embody uh, what they are going after. So that keeps them motivated. They believe that what they are doing is the right thing. I mean, if they weren't doing the job, where would, where would, where would the country be? And it's always a really humbling experience to realise not only that these are people of extraordinary legal ability, of extraordinary commitment to human rights, but also just absolute bravery. I imagine that their job is scary and that they feel that fear, but to be able to manage that and to be able to work with that kind of fear alongside you is, is really something remarkable and, and very admirable. And, and of course, it's inspiring. Him deciding that uh, the the ultimate outcome is a higher priority than his own well-being, and that is remarkable. There are very few people, I think, around the world who do that, and uh, he, he is one of them. Well, I have been very impressed to see the way that the lawyers who work for, with PBI um, are defending uh, human rights, um, not just the environment, but other rights, in much more challenging circumstances than we face here. And so I always have a kind of a mix of admiration, of humbleness and respect. And also there's a bit of me that's also, you know, kind of takes pride in being part of a profession that they're members of as well. My philosophy has always been that we've all got an awful lot to learn. Yes, we are lucky. Yes, we take things for granted. Yes, we haven't had a judge uh, convicted of corruption for 200 years. And when I go around the world, and it's not only with PBI, with the Slynn Foundation in Eastern Europe, with the Commonwealth judges in Black Africa and the Caribbean, one sees uh, brave lawyers standing up for the rule of law, uh, wanting to join in partnerships with us. And it's a partnership of equals, it's not a partnership of uh, teachers and uh, learners in any way. And it is really quite inspiring to be able to be involved in that partnership. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it falls to me to uh, make the first award uh, this evening. But before I do so, can I say what um, a truly moving film that was? Um, and just as there is a book by one of our greatest UK judges, Lord Bingham, called The Rule of Law, which I think should be required and regular reading, for every lawyer around the world. I agree with Dominic that I think we should do our best to make this film seen, not only by politicians, politicians in the UK, but also members of the legal profession worldwide, because that was a, a truly extraordinary film. I noticed six words uh, that were used again and again, talking about first the bravery uh, of so many uh, defenders of human rights and the rule of law around the world, their remarkable behavior, the respect in which we hold them. And it was noticeable, um, and rightly, uh, just how many of the UK-based lawyers talked about the ease with which we can try to promote and support the rule of law, but from the comfort of our jobs without danger in the UK. And we have a luxury that so many of the people featured in that film and who we are going to honor tonight just don't enjoy. But I think the word that was used in that film again and again was one that I was going to use about our, our first award winner tonight, uh, Dina Metza. And that word is humbling because I think so much of what we've just heard tonight is truly humbling. 
And when I look at the reasons why Dina has been nominated tonight for her bravery and resilience and compassion for her fellow journalists, um, I, I just found reading what she has done truly humbling because she has achieved more, uh, I'm ashamed to say, than I probably ever will get close to achieving in my own uh, career and lifetime. It is truly extraordinary. Let me just say a few words about Dina uh, before we look at a short film about her, uh, and then she will also uh, say some words, but a truly uh, worthy winner of, of tonight's first prize. She is uh, an independent journalist uh, and defender of freedom of expression in Honduras. She is the director of the Association for the Defense of Democracy and Human Rights and she is the founder and president of Penn Honduras, an organization that supports journalists at risk. Dina provides legal and educational support to at-risk professionals, journalists, and social communications across Latin America. She has been well recognized already by Amnesty International, and in 2014, she was awarded the Oxfam Novid Penn International Freedom of Expression Prize. During the pandemic, Dina has lobbied her government to grant safe conduits to human rights defenders to allow them to monitor human rights violations, in particular where the government has redirected aid and public funds from public health and relief measures. This and other campaigns have inevitably meant that Dina has faced constant harassment and intimidation on a daily basis. There is something in, in the few words that I've been given about Dina that really stood out to me uh, and really reinforced, reinforces just how humbled I feel. And that is the way in which she conducts her professional life, whereby she regularly receives threatening phone calls, her mobile is tapped, cars without number plates follow her, and armed men invade her house to intimidate her family. We just cannot begin to understand in countries like the UK what that must mean for daily life. But despite these attacks, Dina continues to use her online platform to draw attention to state violence against activists and human rights defenders. And she promotes freedom of expression in Honduras notwithstanding. Dina is a truly worthy winner tonight, uh, and I would invite you now to watch this short clip about her and her work. Soy trabajando a favor de los derechos humanos desde 1989, cuando mi hermano fue desaparecido. Mi organización se llama Asociación por la Democracia y los Derechos Humanos. Eh, apoyamos diversos grupos. Eh, periodistas, comunicadores sociales, comunidad LGTBI, mujeres, jóvenes, indígenas eh, que de alguna manera están sufriendo alguna represión por ejercer la libertad de expresión. Eh, trabajamos el derecho a la protesta eh, con estudiantes de secundaria y de la universidad y les acompañamos en procesos legales por criminalización eh, que puedan estar pasando. Normalmente cuando tú vas a hacer eh, un monitoreo o documentación de casos de derechos humanos suceden estas situaciones. Hay guardias de seguridad en la zona, me ha tocado a mí ir a, a zonas garífunas donde hay guardias de seguridad asediándonos. Eh, esto es un retrato de todo lo que está pasando eh, a la labor de los defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos y periodistas y esto hace que Honduras sea uno de los países más peligrosos para ejercer las dos labores. We are unable, uh, sadly, to make a proper award to Dina in person tonight, uh, but we do have a plaque uh, in an attempt to recognize uh, what Dina has done, and I hope you can now see this. And with that, Dina, I will hand over to you, please, uh, to say a few words. Thank you. You are a very worthy winner. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you so much. Gracias por estar acá. 
este día. Es un honor estar en este evento. Me enorgullece haber sido escogida para recepcionar el premio Sir Henry Brock, un hombre que apoyó la lucha por los derechos humanos y a las personas que nos dedicamos a esta tarea tan peligrosa en estados autoritarios y militarizados. Gracias a Susy Vascon, directora de PBI UK, y a la Alianza de Abogados en Riesgo, a los señores Sir Patrick Elias, Colin Passmore, Dominic Grew, mis agradecimientos. Me llena de orgullo y de mucha responsabilidad que me hayan seleccionado por ser una defensora de derechos humanos en Honduras. Un país donde se ataca a las personas que defendemos y promovemos los derechos fundamentales, a los periodistas y comunicadores sociales que se oponen a una agenda informativa mentirosa. Los crímenes, amenazas, persecución, vigilancia, intervenciones telefónicas y ataques cibernéticos, junto a campañas de desprestigio, son la estrategia de quienes no toleran a ciudadanos y ciudadanas que promovemos la paz y buscamos que se respete o restablezca el Estado de Derecho. Estas son arenas movedizas, sin una institucionalidad funcional y que está cooptada por poderes estatales y fácticos. Honduras pasa por un momento muy crítico, no solo por la pandemia de la COVID-19 y los huracanes, sino por el establecimiento de una muralla de impunidad abrazada con más fuerza desde el golpe de Estado de 2009 y fortalecida con el gobierno de Juan Orlando Hernández, que se mantiene en el poder desde el 2013 y que avanza con la intención de continuar manejando el país a fuerza de militarización, corrupción y cooptación del poder desde la institucionalidad la cual no funciona cuando se trata de proteger a las personas que defendemos los derechos humanos. Nos toca hacer este trabajo a pesar de toda esta situación. No tenemos otra opción. La defensa de los derechos humanos es vital porque las víctimas están viviendo persecución y muerte. Desde mi organización, la Asociación por la Democracia y los Derechos Humanos, ASOPODEO, establecida desde el 2012, apoyamos a las víctimas. Tenemos que hacer acciones aunque choquemos con esa muralla de impunidad, pero nuestro objetivo es derribarla. La persistencia y el trabajo permanente de un equipo muy comprometido ha posicionado a, la, a Sopodeu como una institución clave donde las víctimas pueden llegar y ser apoyadas. Mi organización tiene el periódico digital Paso de AnimalGrande.com, en el cual se considera una herramienta de incidencia para defender y promover los derechos humanos. Sabemos que es crucial publicar notas que toquen estructura y denuncien la situación de las víctimas. La vigilancia permanente y el acoso por el trabajo que hacemos nos ha hecho movernos del lugar, porque es difícil hacer el trabajo cuando tenemos desconocidos afuera que esperan el menor descuido para atacar. Los 31 años de llevar a cabo la defensa de los derechos humanos no ha sido fácil. Sentir en carne propia la persecución tampoco ha sido fácil. Pero Dios me ha dado la fuerza y puesto en el camino ángeles a través de las organizaciones y personas internacionales que me han apoyado y también en Honduras. Salir al exilio, tal como me pasó en el 2013, en una situación que trastoca nuestra vida pero que me llenó de fuerza por la solidaridad que encontré, donde me ayudaron a sobrellevar tantas cosas que me estaban pasando. Quiero contarles que mi familia ha sido un soporte vital en toda esta lucha por los derechos humanos. A mis hijos les ha tocado vivir la incertidumbre de amanecer o no con vida. Hemos sido constantemente acosados solo por defender los derechos humanos consagrados en nuestra Constitución y en convenios internacionales de los cuales Honduras forma parte. Mis hijos son quienes están tras el telón, apoyándome constantemente en esta tarea. Son esos héroes anónimos que me dan la fuerza para continuar. Les agradezco a PBI UK y a la Alianza de Abogados en Riesgo. Necesitamos con urgencia esa mirada internacional que aplaque a la jauría que quiere ver ensangrentada mi patria. Hoy recibo este galardón pensando en los colegas y las colegas defensoras que fueron asesinadas, 
a quienes se les perforó sus cuerpos con balas por defender sus territorios y a las víctimas. Aún los perpetradores no han sido castigados justamente porque el estado de terror establecido pretende robarse la esperanza. Sin embargo, somos una comunidad de paz, resiliente. Nuestra única arma es la palabra, la cual es un arma mortal contra la violencia. Necesitamos un Estado que se retracte de tanta violencia y castigue la impunidad. Queremos una política estatal que fortalezca los derechos humanos y proteja a las personas defensoras de los derechos fundamentales. Es imposible llevarla a cabo con la voluntad de pocos funcionarios que cumplen de alguna manera con su responsabilidad. No podremos lograrlo mientras los impunes y corruptos estén manejando los destinos de Honduras. Mientras ese sucede, seguimos y seguiremos soñando por alcanzar un país democrático, con Estado de Derecho y con los perpetradores tras las rejas. Seguiremos lucha, luchando a pesar de todo, con mucha esperanza. Somos más quienes queremos una nación fortalecida, donde todas las personas puedan decir lo que quieran sin temor a ser secuestradas, amenazadas o muertas. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you for those eloquent words. The second winner uh, and award is to Rinaldo Villalba, and it is my great privilege uh, to make it. We've nominated Rinaldo for his steadfast commitment to justice, which he fights for in the face of incredible odds. He, Rinaldo manages the penal and national litigation for the Jose Alvea Restrepo Law Lawyers Collective, primarily criminal defense and the representation of victims of serious human rights violations in Colombia. Members of this organization have been vilified by the authorities and characterized as defenders of terrorism, particularly since much of his work has been on a case implicating the former Colombian president, Alvaro Uribe in uh, human rights violations. The case is based on allegations of witness tampering and fraud relating to crimes committed during the country's five decades civil war. Claims that the brothers were linked to the creation of a paramilitary bloc have led to further pressure on witnesses from third parties, a substantive threat to the rule of law. Rinaldo has been a member of his collective for 27 years. Colombian non-governmental human rights organization, contributing to the fight against impunity and the construction of an equitable society. The organization is recognized nationally and internationally for its work. The high profile nature of its cases it takes on has exposed it to sustained attacks, threats and intimidation since its foundation. And the case against the former president has made it particularly exposed in this respect. There are some 130 individuals who are subject to profiling and surveillance from parts of the Colombian National Army who are members of the collective and are at risk. In response to these threats, a joint letter has been sent to UN Special Rapporteurs by a number of prominent UK legal groups asking for their intervention and protection for them. And it has been this year a landmark judgment when the detention of the former president was ordered by the Colombian Supreme Court on the 4th of August 2020, a significant day for victory for justice and the rule of law in Colombia. Before the award is made, and I, as I make the award and ask for Rinaldo uh, to speak, we're going to see a short video clip in relation to his work. Históricamente el colectivo de abogados ha sufrido ataques incluso de altos funcionarios del Estado colombiano. Así sucedió durante todo el gobierno de Álvaro Uribe Vélez y de hecho, repito, puso su organismo de inteligencia a atacar a los defensores de derechos humanos en general y específicamente al colectivo de abogados social de Arrestrepo. Estos testigos relacionan a Álvaro Uribe con paramilitarismo 
con la creación de un bloque paramilitar en el departamento de Antioquia. Esa es una de las pretensiones de Álvaro Uribe Vélez y para eso ha acudido a prisiones, a amenazas eh, por, eh, por terceras personas y a otras eh, actividades que la Corte está investigando. A esta comunidad internacional yo quiero decirle que en Colombia se sigue asesinando defensores de derechos humanos, que en Colombia se sigue asesinando líderes sociales, que en Colombia en los últimos dos años han sido asesinados más de 300 líderes y lideresas, que son las personas que en su región están trabajando denodadamente por la protección y la garantía de sus derechos, por la defensa de los territorios. Las autoridades colombianas no han sabido responder para evitar esos crímenes, para ponerle un punto final a estos crímenes. Rinaldo, we can't hand this to you in person, but it gives me great pleasure uh, to show you this plaque, which uh, can, is a recognition of your outstanding work. And I would now like to ask you uh, to address the meeting. Muchas gracias. Eh, quiero agradecer a Susi Vascon, directora de Brigadas Internacionales de Paz del Reino Unido, a la Alianza para Abogados en Riesgo, su presidente Sir Patrick Elías, al señor Dominic Grip, y también al socio principal de la firma de abogados Simos and Simons, el señor Colin Pasmore, por la entrega del premio Sir Henry Brook 2020. Gracias infinita por su preocupación por Colombia y el mundo por las víctimas y las personas defensoras de derechos humanos que entregan su vida por los más caros ideales de la humanidad. Este premio lo recibo con toda humildad. Lo siento como un reconocimiento al trabajo del CAJAR, Organización de Derechos Humanos que actualmente presido y que por más de 40 años ha sufrido la persecución estatal como retaliación por su compromiso al lado de las víctimas en procura de verdad de justicia, de reparación integral y de garantías de no repetición. Alcanzar la paz, construir democracia y promover el Estado de Derecho con fundamento en el respeto a los derechos humanos ha sido nuestra misión. A todas las personas que hacen parte del Cajar les envío un gran abrazo. Ellas saben que este galardón es suyo por estas décadas compartiendo triunfos alegrías, conocimientos, solidaridades y también frustraciones y dolores que son intrínsecos en un país de violaciones de derechos humanos y de impunidades. Gracias por todo lo recibido de parte de ustedes. Gracias totales. Participo el premio también a la Federación Internacional de Derechos Humanos, de la cual soy uno de sus vicepresidentes. Este premio lo recibo y comparto con todas las organizaciones y personas defensoras de derechos humanos de mi país y las miles de víctimas que arroja la violencia sociopolítica en toda la geografía nacional. Desde la firma de los acuerdos de paz entre las FARC y el Estado colombiano, finales de 2016 han sido asesinadas más de 1.050 personas defensoras de derechos humanos y líderes sociales. En solo 2020, van más de 255 personas, líderes sociales y defensoras asesinados. El contexto de pandemia los ha puesto en mayor vulnerabilidad, pues les han matado dentro de sus casas o cerca de ellas. Entre tanto, han ocurrido durante este año 79 masacres, más de 250 excombatientes que le apostaron a la paz y firmaron los acuerdos han sido asesinados. De ellos, más de 55 durante 2020. En el actual gobierno, el presidente Duque también se han incrementado otras graves violaciones de derechos humanos como desplazamiento forzado, las desapariciones forzadas, las torturas, la violencia sexual, entre otros graves crímenes. Mi país, duele decirlo, es un gran cementerio. 
Miles de las tumbas son clandestinas, permanecen ocultas a todas las miradas, sin nombre, a la espera de su rescate, de su reivindicación. En Colombia persiste la sistemática y generalizada violación de derechos humanos, acompañada de una política dirigida a asegurar la impunidad de los máximos responsables, especialmente si los autores y beneficiarios son altos funcionarios del Estado o pertenecen a las élites del poder político y económico. Combatir la impunidad sigue siendo uno de los grandes retos que tenemos que afrontar. Hoy, con mayor dificultad, ante las campañas de desprestigio contra las Cortes y el desacato de órdenes judiciales por parte del alto gobierno, en abierto ataque a los principios democráticos y al Estado de Derecho. Además que el gobierno tiene cooptado los organismos de control. Tememos que el, el país se esté enrumbando hacia una dictadura. Este reconocimiento hoy recibido es un fundamental respaldo a nuestra labor de defensa y promoción de los derechos humanos y anima y fortalece nuestro compromiso en la lucha contra la impunidad, pese a que ejercer la defensa de los derechos humanos en Colombia constituye un alto riesgo para la vida. Tenemos la plena convicción de que el apoyo de la comunidad internacional es definitivo para proteger la labor y la vida de las personas defensoras de derechos humanos. En este punto quiero hacer un reconocimiento al vital acompañamiento que por más de 25 años nos ha brindado PBI en Colombia y en otras partes del mundo. Su acompañamiento ha permitido que nuestro trabajo se mantenga en las diferentes regiones del país pese al clima de inseguridad y amenazas en el que desarrollamos nuestra labor y sin duda ha contribuido a que estemos vivos en este escenario en que la muerte hace presencia cotidiana. Me complace compartir esta ceremonia con la periodista y defensora de derechos humanos hondureña Dina Mesa. Honduras vive, como la mayoría de países de nuestra región, una profunda crisis en materia de democracia y derechos humanos. Me honra ser una de las personas integrantes de la misión de observación calificada de los procesos penales que se adelantan por el asesinato de la inmortal y siempre viva Berta Cáceres, defensora de su pueblo indígena Lenca, del campesinado, del territorio y los recursos vitales ante la avaricia devastadora de megaproyectos hidroeléctricos y mineros. Permítanme hacer un reconocimiento a mi familia, a mi esposa, a mis hijos, a mis hermanos, a toda mi gran familia, quienes han vivido por años la zozobra y la angustia de lo que puede ocurrirme por mi condición de defensor de derechos humanos, por su apoyo permanente e incondicional, pero además porque a nuestras familias se ha extendido la persecución estatal. Igualmente quiero ofrecer este premio a la memoria de mi padre que falle falleció en años recientes, a mi protectora madre que está hoy cumpliendo años, ellos, mis arquitectos de vida. También rememoro a la madre de mi esposa, que no alcanzó a compartir este momento porque la muerte la sorprendió este año. Tuve el privilegio de conocer y compartir con Sir Henry Brock, un humanista íntegro que entregó sus energías y su sabiduría al más alto sentido de justicia. Por eso saludo que se haya creado este premio en su memoria. Sir Henry Brook hizo de la protección y defensa de las personas defensoras de derechos humanos en todas las latitudes del planeta una de sus más loables misiones. Haber conocido de sus calidades humanas me hará llevar con orgullo este premio y prometo estar a la altura de lo que significa ser portador de tan importante reconocimiento. Hago un llamado a los gobiernos y a la comunidad internacional para que mantengan la atención en Colombia sobre la situación de derechos humanos en Colombia, especialmente en relación a las víctimas de graves violaciones de derechos humanos y en la exigencia al gobierno colombiano para que dé cumplimiento integral a los acuerdos de paz que constituyen un paso importante en la construcción de democracia y de superación de la injusticia social y de la inequidad, pues mi país es uno de los más inequitativos del mundo. Gracias a todas las personas que nos están acompañando vía virtual en esta inolvidable y bonita ceremonia. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. 
Thank you, Rinaldo, for those words, and may your good work prosper. And now we will go over to Susie Baskin, who is going to say a few words. Buenas noches a todos y a todas en la audiencia. Eh, quería felicitar especialmente a los ganadores del premio Sir Henry Brook, a Dina Metza y a Reinaldo Villalba, mis queridos defensores que he conocido por muchísimos años y hemos acompañado durante muchos, muchos momentos difíciles. Quiero agradeceros por vuestra persistencia y por vuestro gran compromiso por la justicia social que lo habéis demostrado día a día durante muchos, muchos años. La gota que rompe la roca no lo hace por su fuerza, sino que lo hace por su persistencia. Creo que esa frase define muy bien las cualidades que tenéis los dos de seguir adelante a pesar de las dificultades con esa resiliencia que os caracteriza. Supongo que no existen premios realmente para reconocer eh, la importante y tan arriesgada labor que hacéis como defensores de derechos humanos. Con este premio que lleva el nombre de nuestro querido Sir Henry, lo que queremos es de alguna manera reconocer esos valores que para él eran tan importantes, que vosotros en vuestro día a día y en vuestro trabajo eh, representáis el coraje, la compasión y el compromiso con la justicia. Además, queremos usar esta ocasión para recordaros que no estáis solos ni solas, que la comunidad internacional está a vuestro lado y que seguiremos trabajando y luchando para que podáis seguir haciendo vuestro trabajo. Hoy siento que se completa un círculo. Hace 14 años, Sir Henry fue invitado a un evento por PBI UK. En este evento, Reinaldo habló y compartió su testimonio de vida y profesional. Fue precisamente ese compromiso que Reinaldo demostró en ese evento y que Sir Henry eh, sintió qué es lo que le hizo eh, seguir involucrado con PBI y, y, y en última instancia eh, fundar la Alianza para los Abogados en Riesgo. Después conoció a muchos otros defensores y desde entonces siguió apoyándoles de forma incondicional. Muchas gracias. My name is Henry Brooke. I was a lawyer and a judge for nearly 50 years. I retired 10 years ago, and the month after I retired, I had a letter from Susie Baskin asking me to a PBI event. I wanted to help because it was obviously something which was well worth supporting. It, in a sense, it was a new area for me. There were very, very brave lawyers uh, risking their lives for their clients, and there were these remarkable volunteers going out to assist them. And if there was any way in which I could help uh, galvanise interest in the English human rights world in what they were doing and to provide more support for them, well, seeing as I was completely retired, that was something I could do. I support PBI because the work they do is such important work. I can think of few things um, more difficult, but also more important than defending, than um, accompanying and protecting um, people at risk of violence who are defending the human rights of, of um, other people, often very disenfranchised people. Because the first thing you realize is how comfortable your existence is and how easy it was to hold those principles because it uh, effectively cost you nothing to do, to do so. Um, I think it's only natural that, you know, that privilege makes us a bit complacent. And I think it's useful for us to, to uh, understand the work of others, not only so we can uh, as, as essentially see what we can do to try and assist them in the difficulties they experience but also so we can uh, recognize and understand how important the rule of law uh, and the framework that we currently enjoy is and how important it is look at it, look at your fellow human beings and um think that could have been that could have been me i i, I think the familial pressure would be such that i i wouldn't be able to to do it i um I just am in awe of, of people that can 
uh, work under those pressures, really. It must sometimes feel very lonely. And I hope that through PBI and the Alliance for Lawyers at Risk um, and the various other networks that, that exist internationally, I hope that they do feel that they are supported. Uh, seeing how effective that kind of protection can be and how um, reassuring it was to the people who we, we were accompanying that they had PBI uh, with them and with PBI's network of um, international network of protection behind us, um, you know, it really meant that they could do their jobs. And I think all we can do is sit back and acknowledge uh, that that's a level of commitment we do not have um, and ask them how can we support you. You know, think what you would do Think how you would want people to act if the sh if you were in the situation that human rights um, defenders are are in. I wish I could do more. Uh, when I meet a human rights defender or, or a lawyer facing threats of any kind, my brain starts going into overdrive. What can we do to support? Uh, even though we feel inadequate in doing them because uh, there is uh, there is uh, no direct way in which we can help. That duty or that belief that we can continue working towards the rule of law and human rights should remain like a guiding light within yourself. The budget that's been given to human rights work is constantly under threat. A lot of people say, well, why should we bother with that? Uh, we have other things we need to do which are more important. Well, it's difficult to think of anything which would be more important. Hold on, hold to that, because that will serve you to support uh, other fellow lawyers and human rights defenders around the world. It will serve you to see that there is the need to have the solidarity link with those fellow lawyers and, uh, and human rights defenders. So for the first simple reason is uh, it is a benefit to those human rights defenders and we should listen to them uh, and, and do uh, the things that they would like us to do. And in that way, we will be making a contribution to society. The most you could say is that uh, we, we, we are all supposed to be as lawyers committed to the rule of law. And therefore, we should be committed to support those colleagues who try to function in states where the rule of law is either very weak or non-existent. And uh, we should all be putting more resources into that. And I think that this kind of support helps them to ensure that their motivation to make a difference and to defend human rights is shared uh, I think one should try and reach out to lawyers in other countries and give them support when one can, both financial and, and in practical ways. Lawyers in the UK um, do have the ability to make donations. I know that NGOs in Colombia and also NGOs in the UK are particularly short of funds at the moment. The situation is very dire for them. So as individuals, we can do a lot, even if it's just a few pounds each month to support people. To just let them know that we stand with them, that we are supportive, that we know about the struggles that they're going through. The, the real meaning of commitment to principles and the, and the cost of of showing that commitment, even though you are not required to pay that cost yourself. Uh, and I think people will benefit themselves from that also. We should do that in whatever way we can. We should do it by supporting PDI. We should do it by supporting the work of the Alliance. We should do it by going on delegations. We should do it by writing letters and contributing to legal opinions. And if we can't do any of that, we should do it by giving money to PBI and to the Alliance. I, I've decided to put up £10,000 um, towards this cause, but I would love it to be matched by um, those in the audience tonight. So I would just ask um, whether you would consider um, putting up some money to enable um, me to release this £10,000 that I would love to see PBI have to do its good work.
I'll bring this to an end. Um, firstly, I was going to say I'll congratulate the speakers, but uh, the, the award winners. But in a sense, congratulations isn't quite the right word for a prize of this kind, I think. What, what, what we really should do, I think, is just thank them. Thank them for their hope. Thank them for their courage. Thank them for their optimism. And thank them for uh, helping to try and bring the rule of law in places where it must be so difficult to keep hope alive. Uh, and to believe that you really can achieve something, but you plainly are all achieving something, often in slow, gradual steps. But nonetheless, it's of major importance. And I think we all uh, hope that um, you can all make a contribution and match the very generous £10,000 which has been put up. So let's see if we can match that particular figure. Um, we've heard what value this uh, the PBI has and what value it has to help and support people uh, like Dina and Ronaldo. Uh, and I hope we will um, all wish Ronaldo's mother a happy birthday. Um, but can I thank you all for coming? Can I thank Dominic and Colin for their involvement in all of this? Um, I think it's been a special uh, evening. I wish, um, as I say, we could have all been together. I hope too that re when Ronaldo and uh, Dina are in the country, if they come to England, they'll get in touch and let some of, the, some of us meet them. That would be a great pleasure. So thank you everyone for coming uh, and uh, I will let everyone go and dwell upon what you've heard this evening. Thanks very much, bye-bye. Muchas gracias. Muy agradecida. Adios. Adios. Delighted to do it. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Hasta luego.